this is a Zoom room and technical issues do come up. So if any of our moderators or panelists time out or there's glitching out, just be patient. We'll get back to the goods as soon as we possibly can. All right, back to you, Olivia. Thanks, Matt. So we're now on day two of three of our annual auction and fundraiser. Thank you to all of the artists here tonight who've donated their work. There's still time to bid on art and packages from local businesses. So uh, not right now, but as soon as this lecture is over, I urge all of you to visit the artblog.org or visit us on at Philly Art Blog on Instagram. There you'll have the opportunity to bid on over 30 pieces of art or some of our sponsorship packages from local businesses and beyond. So I wanna thank our auction sponsors, Jeremy Frank and Associates, Voyage Actually, Practical Reasoning Analytics, Seven Arts Framing, the Anthenaeum of Philadelphia, Fishtown Animal Hospital, Mark J. Monroe, Griffith Insurance, LLP, and La Colombe Coffee Roasters. So, and if you just need the most art blog in your life, don't miss our live online extravaganza hosted by guerrilla performance artist, Beth Heinley as Andy Warhol with performances by local artists and musicians. That's 7 to 9 p.m. tomorrow night on Instagram Live. Just follow us at Philly Art Blog. Now to tonight's program, I want to start by making a huge thank you to the Sachs Program for Arts Innovation at the University of Pennsylvania for sponsoring tonight's talk. I especially want to thank the Sachs staff, John McInerney and Chloe Risen for their continued support. So to introduce our speakers, Ken Lum is an artist, writer, Pew Fellow, and Marilyn Jordan Taylor, Presidential Professor and Chair of Fine Arts at the Weitzman School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania. Lum's political and identity-focused works have received international critical acclaim. He can participated in the original art blog, Art and Social Responsibility Conversation, back in 2015. Karen Olivier is an artist, Pew Fellow, and Associate Professor of Sculpture at the Tyler School of Art and Architecture at Temple University. Her historically informed interdisciplinary works have won numerous prestigious awards and have been exhibited internationally. And my co-moderator, Jacques Liu, former presenter for art project manager, Philadelphia Office of the Arts, Culture and the Creative Economy. And myself, Olivia Menta, another co-moderator. I'm an art blog board med member along with Jacques. And uh, I'm the executive assistant and project manager at the Tyler School of Art and Architecture. So we're gonna spend the first 30 minutes following questions and then we'd like it to open it up to our audience to allow for a dialogue across us. And while we're talking, if you think of a question, just as Matt said, pop it into the chat. So that was a lot. Now for our first question. Ken, Karen. Are right. there any <laughs> are there any specific stories or people who have shaped how you make art, specifically as it relates to social responsibility? Yeah. I there's many people, um, you know, when I, when, first of all, I think it's better to answer it this way. When I emerged, uh, entered into the art system, it was during the tail end of conceptual art. There was at least discursively this sense of opening that was unprecedented, that involved the inclusion of otherness, of women artists, of artists of uh, sexual difference that could announce themselves publicly as so and uh, artists of color and also um, inclusion of artists who live along the margins as opposed to the center of the art system. And so I was shaped during this moment when uh, a lot of conceptual artists, at least in terms of, their, in terms of the, the articulation of the work, dealt with this idea of a globalized world, a, a globalized world that was both unified and also breaking up at the same time. Uh, into, you know, nodal points and, 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 and little villages and little communities and so on. So those artists would be like Dan Graham, uh, Martha Rossler, uh, James Collins, uh, artists like that. Art, artists that were in and, and Fluxus artists, you know, um, Adrian Piper. So a lot of the, Lydia Clark, a lot of those artists were, were still actively uh, 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 making work at that time. And uh, I feel very lucky uh, that I was shaped by them at that time. I think for me, it's <clears throat> maybe a little more personal 
um, I don't know how interesting it is. I think about how I started art late. I decided to go back to school at 30 and study ceramics. And I remember when I started making work, I think I was acutely aware that I didn't have the skills, I didn't have the background, and I kind of was very interested in just thinking about what was there. I remember um, also thinking about I wanted my family to be interested. I mean, from an immigrant family, I wasn't supposed to be an artist. That wasn't the plan. We have doctors, we have lawyers. It's that kind of story. My parents worked two jobs while going to school for a purpose, not for me to be an artist. So when I started making work, I definitely wanted my family to get it and to be engaged. I wanted my niece and nephews to get it. So I engaged like playgrounds and things like that. I think also about um, being from Trinidad and, and carnival is a big part of the culture. And a lot of it is about making do, or what does it mean that what's familiar um, gets become strange? It's about the most simple means of making. You take a, a cloth, you put it on, on your face, and it's a mask. You take a piece of cloth, you take wire, you make bat wings and you're a bat. So something about like the what if, something about the possibilities, something about a future being lived now. But I also think about those um, 10 years, you know, between college and and grad, when I went back and studied art, I used to work at Bloomingdale's as a, as a buyer for designer handbags and store manager, different, different like retail management stuff. But I remember I used to pass by on my way to the Decal Avenue train station, this billboard, and I would see it every day. And it was Felix Gonzalez Torres, the one of the unmade, the unmade bed. And I remember every day wondering what that was. I was like, I don't think it's an ad. And I was thinking about ads, of course, because I was working in, a, in a, a retail fashion kind of industry. And I kept thinking about the narratives and the possibilities. And of course, it was how many years later that I discovered, oh, this is a very important art. This, but I like that idea of like a simplicity at the everyday. I like that that work made me, the repeat viewings kind of allowed for possibilities and the opening up of what it could mean for my own life. I like that it was both personal, but what it means to display the personal in that public realm. And then of course I found out the politics and, and I think I think about that in my work. How do you have something that kind of has someone recognize, but then there's that maybe there's something that you assume and the assumption maybe gets challenged, but then allowing a space for you to enter the work as well. Yeah. It's really great to hear about all of these sort of like uh, shared experiences you know, that you, you both seem to have. Um, moving to thinking about how that relates to sort of social responsibility, you know, like both of you, I think, um, deal with in a very personal way in your work, um, social responsibility. Um, I'd love to hear perspectives on how you think public art engages with the community, both in the present day and historically. So sort of to guide that, my question is, what role does public opinion play in the artistic process? And what role do you think it should play? Well, first of all, I think, um, you know, uh, social purpose for art is different from, uh, you know, if you ask me, uh, should, should, should um, an individual, me as an individual should live life as an ethical person. And I feel like I have social responsibility as a, as a, as a good citizen to better the society. That's slightly different from asking me as an artist that same question. I'm more interested in, in what, the, what is the role that art plays and how does art play its role at its best capacity? And, and, and often, you know, we know that, for example, form and content um, functions in a very diametrically opposite to uh, a, a relationship to the way we expect uh, it to work. That is this content which we try to deliver often appears paradoxical to the form it takes, right? And that's the magic of art. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be predictable or consistent in parallel. And so, um, and so as an artist, I, I, I think, you know, that's how I would a answer that question of, um, you know, uh, of art's kind of social functioning. Now, art in a public context, I think, for, for any artist that wants to make public art, you have to, first of all, imagine in a, in, in a kind of predetermined sense, what is the audience? Who is the audience? What are the, audi what, what are the multiple publics that make up that audience for your work, even before the work 
is in place, right? And, uh, and I would say that um, and does it require the engagement of that? So, uh, so many processes do, right? But ultimately, you know, as an artist, I will try to read that uh, response from the public in, in take it into account, but ultimately I will be making the, the decision in terms of the, in terms of the composition, the look uh, of the work. Yeah, I, I don't really see a, a, a difference between the role of the artist and a person. I mean, I tell my students, my most important job is just to remind each other that we have to be active and engaged citizens in the world. I think about, I don't think about my responsibility is equal to the, the viewers, it's equal to the public. If anything, I think about our accountability in terms of being empathetic with each other, our accountability, making sure everyone to the to our most of our ability or to help people to have agency. Um, I think when I think about social responsibility, it's such a, there's, it's, there's no app, to me there, it can't be an absolute because every, Every situation is, is different. It should be kind of treated as such, um, be it the demographics, be it the history, the historical nature of the site. I mean, I just feel like there's so many things to consider that there isn't kind of one way, but to me key is I think about like empathy, agency, and I always go back to Bell Hooks that love is the most radical act in a political act. So how does that engage um, these public spaces? But, it, it, but specificity, Specificity. So the idea of like your original question was something about uh, this public opinion. I think that's too soft in a way. It's like I, I think of it as an active thing. Like let's get in this, and and because we're actively engaged, and because we're going to have some sort of democratic thing happening, that doesn't mean it's necessarily consensus. Right? Yeah, if, if I could just add to that, I, I think uh, I agree with uh, uh, Karen in terms of public opinion being too soft in the sense that. It depends, you know, if you're just a canvas people in general, I, I'm not sure how, how much value I would place in terms of that opinion, right? Because you would get maybe platitudes in response. But one, one um, um, a, a set of opinions I do value are, are, are the, the opinions of the underclass, of the people who are really oppressed, of the people who are really at the limits of what's, what's, what constitutes the citizenry of the United States. Those people who are never heard, those people, their opinion, I always try to take into account of, because I think their public voice is not only not heard, but the most uh, wise and, and most meaningful. And so um, when people say, well, do, should, you, should you pull the immediate uh, environment of the site, the public that lives there, is their opinion of value? Yes, it's of value. But I would say it's also limited in terms of uh, that, right? So because there's a lot of people that maybe, you know, they like going to uh, Philadelphia Eagles games on Sunday, but maybe they're not that interested in art, right? So, and it doesn't bother me, right? So, so it's not that I don't value them as fellow citizens. I just don't, I'm not going to overdetermine the value of their, of their opinions. So, so uh, that's how I would answer it in, in terms of the question of public uh, input. So what, what I'm hearing then is... Wait, John, were you, were you speaking in reference to like a public art commission where the community has a say in either voting and things like that? Because I think that also depends. I did a project at the University of Kentucky and there were people who gave their opinions, but they were students and faculty. They're, not that their opinion, opinion didn't matter, but I just didn't have that weight. We were kind of like on the same place. But then when I'm doing a project with um, the Dyna Memorial, where I'm actually dealing with a community that actually has been overlooked, that is oppressed, yeah. you know, and someone, when we had several community meetings and one of the final community meetings where I kind of presented my revisions and revisions, you know, a community member um, said, why don't you add this to the project? And one, I took it because it was someone highly respected. Number two, it was super smart. And it was number three, it was something that I should not have overlooked. Like the thing she posed was something that, Yes, I live adjacent to that neighborhood, but I'm in Germantown, I'm not in nice town. So she was able to see something that I just couldn't see. So I was open to listen. And there were other things people mentioned that I'm like, actually, no. But there was like, what, who is the person? What is their position? How invested are they? I mean, that was someone who went to every single meeting. 
it was like lives there, it was like committed. So I think that, like, again, it's like, it, it's a circumstance and we have to be as artists sensitive. Again, it goes back to earlier what Ken was saying, it can't be, we're not making something that everyone's gonna just like or that's visually appealing or taste is irrelevant on some level. You wanna seduce people to kind of engage for a moment, but it's not about pleasure necessarily. It's not about, it's about the questions. It's about the inquiry, being a site of inquiry, right? I totally agree with that because often I'll do a public art piece and rather than, you know, just um, accede to some, you know, nondescript poll of uh, all kinds of opinion from that area, I'll get to know people and I'll, and I'll find certain people I find much more interesting than other people, right? And then I will ask and seek their opinion. And I think that's more particularized. So for, for me, you know, like as someone who's worked in the public arts sector for seven years, that question is exactly, you know, how you two approached it. I think that you both know, and I think really it has to do with, um, uh, you know, you both, I think, are clearly very good at empathetic and active listening. And you don't necessarily have to know exactly, uh, you know, you're not checking boxes in order to engage what the community sentiment is. And I think at the heart of that question is how can we as artists, you as artists, help others who are in the position of doing that, city planners, et cetera, help them do that because they, they don't have these superpowers that you have. So what is it about that? You know, like uh, how, do you, how do you come about those powers? Is it something in your training? Is it something personal? You know, uh, it can be anecdotal, you know. Okay, um, that sounds like a Karen Olivier first response question. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, in many ways, you know, city planners and, and you know, they, they're, they function in a certain way. They think they have a world view because of their training and, and it goes, uh, you know, it's like the distinction between uh, lived experience and conceived experience. If anyone's read like Henri Lefebvre, La Production de l'Espace, right? And so on. So, um, you know, the difference between what he calls social practice and the difference between social practice as lived, that's two different things. So, you know, there's a kind of tension there between uh, urban planning. And so uh, in these kind of public art um, processes, you know, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, you know, uh, it goes through planning, it goes through and uh, all these administrative um, departments and you have to be savvy enough to understand their language, understand their culture and also persuade them. But I find um, um, that if, uh, you know, most planners are very open to, to artists, they're sympathetic to artists. So, so but it is, it, is, um, it is a challenge to, you know, persuade and to argue for, for your ideas. Well, I, I think too, it's important for, I, I tell my, again, I feel like I'm equal parts artist and educator. I, I tell them the importance of having different publics for your work. And within that, there's different responsibilities to that. Um, yeah. Give me your question again in a different way. Like, I guess, hmm. Give your question in a different way. Or just restate it. Um, hmm. Well, Olivia, do you want to you want to ask a question? I have another one that I think was is relevant, though it's a longest thread. But I want to. You know, well, I wanted to talk a little bit about. I wanted to get the conversation a little about about permanence. So uh, there's a long term permanence yet temporality with public art. It gets weathered, abused, loved, tarnished. And my question really surrounds, should we, should we be preserving art? Can it be done responsibly? And how do we preserve art that conflicts with our contemporary ethics and social standards? Well, you, you cited it yourself, Olivia, you know, the, the so-called permanence of art or the seeming permanence of art is, is maintained, right? It's, it's, and it's expensive, right? Even bronze, which has been around for thousands of years, needs to be maintained, it needs to be waxed, it needs to be cleaned, uh, you know, probably twice a year. If you're near the, near the sea, it probably should be four times a year. And, uh, and you have to have a budget for that, right? So it's not, otherwise it would oxidize and would start breaking down over time, like anything, 
right? The ent forces of entropy would take over, right? So, but I think what you're speaking about is uh, monuments and, and their um, projection of permanence, of that they, they represent a kind of um, content that, that is supposed to endure uh, uh, in a, 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 you know, through infinity and, and so on. And, uh, but I think that's a convention that's, um, that hasn't really been borne out in history because monuments come down all the time throughout history, right? And so on. So, um, because history gets constantly being revised, constantly being reconsidered. I actually think that's, that's healthy. You know, and, and so on. And I, I think, but I think another path which would be even healthier is if um, counterpoised histories, as many, many other histories, because there's many histories that take place at the same time as the dominant history is unfolding, if they were allowed to be also be recognized and addressed, then that would mitigate, um, you know, this question of the, the you know, unitary permanence of, 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 of the dominant narrative monuments. Yeah, I, I think we just have to kind of open up to just because a material is can be permanent doesn't mean it has to last it needs to be displayed forever i think about I think back to my piece at, at, that, that i'm working on for dinah i like that it's going to age and it won't be about cleaning it up like i want to see the aging of the the stone i want to see the moss i think it depends on what when it's how how the work is supposed to serve sometimes that i think about monuments i think about they're living, breathing entities. So in that, when is it okay for them to kind of show that history? But then you have something like last summer, the Frederick Douglass um, statue being ripped down. No, that needs to go back. The location of, of him living there, the location of the, that speech, of course that has to be repaired. So, but how do we decide collectively? Like, you know, monuments are there for us to decide that we collectively decide we agree on something, but who's deciding? I'm gonna say, of course, Frederick Douglass should be there hopefully we all kind of socially and kind of could believe that certain things matter. So, but I think, I think that's a tricky thing. I was thinking earlier about what you were asking, the earlier question, we can go back to yours. When I was thinking about the public artists and what they, what they can do, I think artists get too caught up in worrying about, we're so in the capitalist structure that they think that we have to like, public art has to be about beautification. And when all these city planners come and they want to beautify, it's like, no, 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 beautification isn't, well, I think, but then we say, let's do it, let's do it because I want to have a gig. I want to like get paid. I want like, how, but if you realize, I remember Hank Wills Thomas told me once, so I felt we're talking about, I think some of the work is a little too simplistic. And I think he's a great artist. Um, he's like, yes, but that work is constantly being sold and that allows me to do these other projects. So it doesn't mean to have your works functioning in different ways. And not that you don't believe in all the work, but what does it mean for me to make sure potentially I could sell something here but then I don't have to kind of give in in this other space. I don't have to kind of succumb to that public. I've had public art pieces where I've kind of decided not to do because I realized it was a beautification project. I mean, I've only now this year at 52 gonna have a gallery in New York, you know what I mean? You could still have that happen. So like, how can you be conscious of what, how we're being played, how we're being used? You have the agency. This whole, everything, everyone else goes away without us. So how do you, Demand, and yes, there's always someone else who's willing, but I go back to Confederate monuments. Artists made those monuments. <laughs> How did we agree to that? You know what I mean? So, okay, I'm gonna stop my rant for a minute. Well, okay, so sticking with monuments, let's get real like specific here, the real nitty gritty, right? Philadelphia, we have a couple of monuments, which are uh, one has come down, Rizzo statue came down last, last this year, this summer. It seems like last year because time is irrelevant now. Um, Christopher Columbus is scheduled to come down. Uh, I'd love to hear you both talk about the role you think that these statues play in our history as Americans and the role they will assume after these present day conversations. You know, and I, I know where I fall and I suspect most people on this call fall on that same side of things. But I've also met a lot of people who said that this is part of our history, regardless, and it's, it's been taught. So we can't ignore it. And so I, th I think I want to sort of, as you're saying, as both of you have been saying, the different audiences, you know, like, so what do you think from that perspective? Well, 
No, well, well, first of all, Karen Olivia mentioned she's 52, but she looks like she's like 28. So, <laughs> <laughs> but um, well, well, first of all, it's not as if you know because the Rizzo statue came down, right? That somehow we're not we're, he disappears from history. He's in the history books. You can look him up. He's probably got a Wikipedia page, right? And uh, you could, you know, the history of Philadelphia will has covered, and and in the future will cover some more his tenure for better or for worse. So it's not like he disappears from history. So I never understood that argument that somehow, you know, oh, we have to preserve history because you know we take this down. We're just talking about a piece of bronze, right? Not a very distinguished sculpture. Why is that the embodiment of history as opposed to all kinds of books that write about, or that speak about Rizzo and his, and his tenure as police chief and later as mayor? It's already there, so the history does, doesn't disappear. I'll let Karen speak and then I have more Yeah, questions. I mean, it's, it's, it's to me, I, I can't not equate those with the Confederate monuments. You know, they're positioned there to be sites of, to keep people and keep you in your place. There's, they're there as positions of power to show what matters to the cities, white, white, white supremacy matters. I mean, they're in that same category. I mean, Christopher Columbus, my God, um, look at, uh, just go in a little tiny bit into the history of that, of that man. And you're like, how could this be? I mean, so certain ones, I mean, I wrote that Washington op-ed this summer and, it, and I was kind of posing that there are certain monuments I believe have to go because of what they represent. We all know at this point, the Confederate monuments weren't made at that time. They were made at specific moments, Reconstruction, they made civil rights. We know when those were made. They weren't about that history, so that we could just forget about. So what do we do? I'm interested in like, what are, are there any that, what are things that are complicated that could potentially be used instead? But I think that there's certain ones that kind of have to go to St. Christopher Columbus. How do we kind of debunk and get out of the history books where kids are still being taught? We don't even need his monuments because in the, you look at the history and go, kids are being taught, they're still being taught that that is, that is the, the, the foundation of this country. So I, I, have, I have no worries about never melt it down, melt them down. No, but I, but I understand Jacques' question um, because um, I think you're, you're referring to the, the uh, Italian community, Italian American community who um, themselves faced, um, you know, not an, a small degree of uh, bigotry and, and uh, against them because they were considered swarthy Southerners, you know, at the margins of the, uh, of, uh, you know, white Europeans and so on. So not quite white and, right. So they suffered um, their own kind of, um, you know, secondary status at one time, right? Now- yeah, first, But, but my, my thing is in why that should not be the statute to represent that. Right, no, 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 I, no, I agree. I, I'm just trying to make the point that, that um, and that, but that, that's also some time ago now. That's not like, that was a few generations ago. I don't believe that, you know, a 30-year-old a or a 40-year-old Italian today is going to go and have the same kind of feeling that Christopher Columbus represented, this kind of unifying, proud moment for Italian-Americans. Maybe 100 years ago, if you were Italian-American, I'm not, I'm not mitigating, uh, you know, the kind of um, negative aspects of Christopher Columbus. Right, but I'm saying that one time, that's who, you, you, that's who would be the embodiment of, of a kind of integrative symbol for Italian Americans. But that was a long time ago, right? And I think it's, and I do think, you know, Karen brought up education. You dig a little bit into Christopher Columbus, by the second trip, he enslaved 400 Native Americans, right? That's another hi history that's not so, uh, I've talked about the, the, the slavery that was visited upon Native American bodies for several hundred years, um, and then not uh, repealed around 1826 or 1827, right? And then uh, Christopher Columbus himself, wh why, did he, why was he on this trip? For, for avarice and greed. And who was he sponsored by? He was sponsored by Isabella and, um, and Ferdinand, right? And who were F Ferdinand and, Isab and Isabella? They were the a royal family that said, let's, hey, let's prosecute this, the uh, Spanish Inquisition, right? So, I mean, it just, and it goes on from there, right? So, I think those facts also need to be known. That narrative needs to be known. And, and, I, and uh, so, it's a failure of the education system. It's a failure of, uh, and, and a lack of courage, I would say, 
to to take on certain topics because there was uh, because certain people would say, "Oh, we're afraid of uh, you know uh, the Italian response or and, and so on." But I, I actually think that's actually not probably not true for most. So, so might might there be a way that these sculptures can educate them? You know, like sub subverting it from celebration to education. You mean by keep keeping them? I'm just saying that. Yeah, actually. Or erecting monuments. To. Like there's so many Italian Americans in history or Italians in history that represent very interesting social movements yeah. like Autonomia and Sacco and Vanzetti. I mean, there are Italians in history that I think many in the Italian American community don't know about. Right, they're not represented. They're not taught it, to go back to Karen's point. You know, we don't learn about them. Right. Yeah, fully. So there's certain myths we hold on to, and I think about history is told in fragments, and it's as if that we just picked and choose the couple that kind of appease white supremacy and say let's stick with those. It's like, but we know that history is constantly being unearthed. So this fragmentary nature has to be looked back at, and now we start to piece together and realize we don't need to hold on to Christopher mm -hmm. Columbus. He's like the bottom of the pile now. When we start, if we lit allowing for the space to happen, because the history is being unearthed. Right. I mean, it's just who's deciding to look at the archives, who's deciding to really do the digging. We're a culture that's very much likes to touch the surface. And artists are the worst. I'm the worst. Just enough knowledge to make my work. Just, <laughs> and that's a problem too. When I was making my obelisk pieces, like Karen, you have to go in deep, because I'm so used to kind of like just enough. It's like I was like, no, sometimes we have to go in. And I think about that with the educational system. That's why people are holding on to that. Well, I, I, well, Christopher Columbus is kind of unique in the sense that it's not just about Christopher Columbus, but it's also about the foundational narrative of, of the United States. And he's tied to that foundational narrative. But the fact is that that foundational narrative was, was, was uh, you know, slave endemic. It was, it was all on the backs of exploited bodies, killed bodies, violence, and so on, right? And uh, people hold on to this kind of myth for fear that, Fear that if we don't hold on to this myth, then there's nothing, right? But instead of seeing it as an opportunity to kind of reinvent, right? I mean, I think as an individual, I mean, I came to Philadelphia like eight years ago. Why? I saw it as an opportunity to reinvent myself, right? Not, 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 as, not as a faker, I just mean reinvent myself anew in, in terms of a, a new, you know, and that's always important, reinvention, right? And I think history offers an opportunity for a nation to reinvent itself redefine itself to become a better nation. I think that also, I want to circle that back on that permanence question. The idea of reinvention is so challenging for so many of us. I think we know in COVID-19 how much change can really rattle us, not just in our professions, but as a community. And so how, with making so many things of permanence, can we think about them flexibly, more adaptively, so that they can actually change in the future? Well, I, I think one of the problems with the you know, monumental landscape um, as it is, is that there are very few countervailing statues that deal with all kinds of worthy subjects. So what we have is a re a iteration, reiteration uh, of, of basically the dominant narratives right? This businessman was important, or this guy was important, almost all guys, right? In Philadelphia, you know, Sharon Hayes did a piece for Monument Lab. The only two women, that, uh, full figure women, hist uh, that's historically presented in, in over a thousand statues in, that comprise the inventory of Philadelphia, right? And yet, very few countervailing ones, right? And so, Octavius Cato, that was only, what, in 2018, that came out on, onto the a apron of City Hall, the first full figure officially sanctioned African-American statue. So, which is shameful, right? So that's part of the problem of the permanence of monument tell is that it's overdetermined by a lack of countervailing uh, uh, monuments. Totally, totally agree, totally agree. But that, I don't, and I know, I said this last night at the Charles Library talk, like we're playing catch up. You know, like, okay, former slave, save Stenton House, let's make them. <laughs> and I get the, the, the necessity, but I do wonder, I'm not trying to fall into that same, I feel as it has to be multiple ways that we engage this. Yeah. Education, monuments, performance, activation, just small gestures could have multiple meanings. I mean, 
I feel as though we're relying on that. There's too much reliance on what that has meant historically, and we're still buying into what, into that. Yeah, and more, it, needs and more. Different, it needs to sit in. It has to engage us in different platforms and ways. Yeah, I agree with that. And also, I think you know, is is removal of a problematic statue, uh, uh, you know, the settlement of uh, a problem such as racism. The racism is still there. Once, even if you remove the right, so it may quell a kind of energy and kind of anxiety and a kind of wish fulfillment to remove it because you know people it's so abhorrent, so kind of you know, repugnant, a presence, the, let's say the Rizzo statue and so on. But does that mean that racism uh, and, and the uh, police violence, particularly against African-Americans goes, goes away, right? So, you know, the solution is, is, has to be more holistic than just simply removal of statues. Absolutely, absolutely. Thinking collectively, I think this is a really great time for us to open up the, the dialogue to all of the participants here tonight got a good good almost 40 people which is incredible thank you all for coming tonight um i want to start off with a question from patrick one of our um auction committee volunteers a valuable valuable member of our staff um he asks there's a certain finality to visual art even if it is open to interpretation by the viewer how do you design a public work of art to ask a question but not impose an answer or point of view well, Karen, you're doing that with the... Uh... Yeah, I have a project right now that's literally, <laughs> that's the charge. Yeah. Um, I could just describe it briefly. I mean, there's, you know, Dinah was a, the former slave at the Stenton House. Um, and during the Revolutionary War, um, they were kind of burning down the house in that area. Uh, they come to, 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 they come in and tell her, gather your things, we're about to burn your house down. Where's your hay? She's like, go to the barn, get the hay. The police come and like, are there any deserters? She's like, yes, the deserters are in the barn. So she saved Stenton House. So for years and years, all the, there was a plaque on the grounds. Um, and of course, the plaque is, was a big deal at the time because at that time, there were, I think there were no um, commemorations to any Black women. But when you read the plaque, it's literally just about her saving Stenton House. So this memorial, I kept, I said, what am I going to make? There's nothing. We don't know her last name. We don't know when she was born. Like there was no, nothing. So I kept asking questions. So in the end, I'm making this kind of, um, so I have to use, I'm making like almost like a, a silhouette um, portrait, imagined portrait of her. And on each side, there are gonna be 10 questions. And one side of the questions are as if you're asking Dinah, like, where were you born? How did freedom feel? How would you wish to be remembered? Did you ever have, what was your, the best part of your day? And this is the question that someone, um, a community member said, did you ever wish we'd let it burn? So you have those questions and the other side is gonna be questions as if she's asking you, where were you born? What led you here? Do you feel free? So my hope was that you could be having this internal questioning for yourself. You could be imagining her position. Maybe it's a class that's come asking each other these questions. So that was my way of, I, it's no answer. Like all those questions cannot be answered because certain things are being discovered. I just found out recently that the site where we're putting it is actually where we think she's buried. So that's kind of a, a surprising thing that happened. But my hope is that maybe things could be revealed about her over, over the years, while my questions are kind of like the, the what ifs, the imaginings of a, of, a, of a past, or what does it mean to ask these questions which you're asking of yourself to, how do I want to be remembered? So that was like my attempt to kind of not, I know initially they just wanted a sculpture and the way now they kind of, the budgets kind of got crazy. I'm like, I don't want to have a sculpture that someone just walks around. Like that's not, I don't know what to do with that. Like that becomes too finite, I mean, even though, I do try like in the monument lab to make the sculptures not sit still. To me, it just seems to be more important to, and I'm engaging a person that we know so little about that it's just a site for us to ask questions and to ask questions about what is this moment now? How different are we now than we were then? So yeah, I'm, I'm really into trying to do that, the questions. Yeah. Right, and with respect to Patrick's question, I don't really agree with the premise because I, I think uh, very good public art um, do open up questions and uh, they become embraced by the public precisely because of the, the intrigue in terms of the production of questions. They don't necessarily impose an answer. There is a narrative, there is a tendency and that's put forward, but, but really good works of art, all right, public works. Uh, you know, think of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, think of the Rachel White Reed's uh, you know, uh, Jewish Library in Vienna, 
there's lots of uh, instances uh, I can cite. And, yeah, and if it's not doing that, it's bad art. Any art, public or not. <laughs> there is bad art in the world. That happens sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is great. Uh, moving to another audience question. They, can the person ask the question? Can oh, yeah. Do you guys want to do it? That's yeah. great. We'll just go in order, do you guys want, or whoever wants to do it. I'm a mutant. I nominate Morgan. Morgan, go. Hey. Hey. <laughs> How are you all? Oh, it's such a joy to see your face. <laughs> oh, sorry, there's like a motorcycle going by outside. Um, so, my question was from a question from what you guys were talking about a while ago, but I actually sent it privately to Patrick. Um, so how do we stop the cycle of artists and artist communities being used, especially in Philadelphia as chess pieces in the process of harmful urban development? And Karen, you had said um, something about rejecting uh, beautific <laughs> beautification public art projects. And do you think that in certain cases, depending on the neighborhood, this is a, a way of protesting this, the urban development by not putting maybe like a, um, a tourist attraction in a certain neighborhood that could then be come in and get developed? I think so. I, th I would love for artists to trust <laughs> That, they're, that what they want matters, it could happen. Or, or I remember being proposed, I was, propo I was turned in a proposal, I was asked to turn in a proposal for a mural and it was not your traditional mural. It was kind of, it. and they encouraged me, but in the end they didn't take it. And they went with the one, I mean, it's beautiful, it's nice, but it's like, this is not what my neighborhood needs to see in Germantown. Back the stores, back when it wasn't a black neighborhood. I don't know if that's, <laughs> I don't know if that's the thing we want to see. The reminder of when it was like a good neighborhood, when it was successful. You know, so that was a case where it was, a, 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 it was a, almost an opportunity to do something else and didn't happen, but we can say no. Why not? I feel like artists could be doing more like guerrilla things. I mean, I have some students who just do things out in the world. They're not as professional artists to think about like the money thing, but they're putting work out there. And I'm like, you did what? I feel like we have space, but have, it's okay to say no, I'm not going to participate. And someone could say, how can you say that, Karen? You've got a teaching gig, da -da -da, you're set up. I'm like, I have a teaching gig, but it's not like I'm making money. Maybe I will soon with Tanya, we'll see what happens. But you know what I mean? Like, we, we, we don't have to fall into that. Well, I mean, Morgan, I think uh, your question is really about the instrumentality of, uh, of the artists, right? Instru becoming an instrument of uh, private developers and, and the kind of uh, administrative functioning of public art within the realm of city hall in in partnership with the, with with development and planning and so on and that is an, that is a problem i i wrote about that uh, several essays you just get my book it's just a chapter <laughs> on that precisely you can buy it on amazon right but um give it title put it in the chat but, no but no but just to further uh what karen's saying there's all kinds of artists right you're always going you're going to get the professional public art artists and they aim to please Right. They, when I say please, they aim to please some popular idea of what public art should be and how it should perform in line with the architect, landscape architect, and the development. Right. And uh, they and they can have a very successful career that way. Right. And and many people may even like it. They go, wow, there's interactive. It's kind of fun, and and that's the only demand they place of uh, of art because that's the only ambition they 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 claim for art. Right. So. You know, how can we stop it? I don't think we can stop it unless you have a police state, right? So that's just the way it is. As an, but me as an individual artist, I'm like Karen, I would weigh those questions. Am I interested in participating in this, in this project where, you know, people become, became displaced? So, you know, just for an opportunity for my art so I can make some money, I, I've consistently said no in my career. But it's not, not just about projects, because, you know, I'm not getting approached to to do any public projects, but choosing where maybe your studio space is. You know, a lot of the affordable studio spaces for artists who are working in the service industry or, you know, the art world doesn't always have a lot of money to offer, they're in Kensington um, or in Southwest Philadelphia. Right, so you're talking about gentrification, how the artists are usually in the avant-garde of that, uh, 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 bef the, uh, as a kind of precursor generation of, of inhabitants prior to gentrification taking place. That's usually, they do all the kind of heavy lifting 
before gentrification takes place. And then when, when gentrification takes place, they can't afford to live in the neighborhood that they actually help to improve, right? That, that's, that is a, you know, it's a hornet's nest, that's for sure. Yeah, you look at, you know, Fiesta Gates, I remember him saying at some point, his neighbors were like, wait, you're raising the value. Like I, and I, I now can't afford to buy. Like he was first saying, we all need to buy up our property and do these things. And he's like, wait, now because of your status and the whole project, now I don't have access. So it's a tricky, it's definitely a tricky thing. That's no denying. But I think when I look at examples where artists have done amazing things, you have someone like Mark Bradford, you know, rock star, you know, he built like, you know, there's, there's like, a center for things to happen. Lauren H H Helsley in South, South Central, she has, she's like, I'm making money, I'm making a rec center, I'm staying in my neighborhoods, I want you guys to stay. There are examples where it's, ha it's happening in, in Germantown, there are people, are stay there are people or there's enough of a community of folks who are committed to staying and the artists are recognizing who they are and working in partnership. I'm seeing that more, I'm getting a little nervous because people are coming now to my neighborhood more, but, but there is a thing of, there are enough people who aren't going anywhere, you know? So I think it's, it's a tricky one because artists are, we're the worst in a lot of ways. But it's also important to take an international perspective and, and recognize that the prevailing uh, model of real estate development is, is very particularly American here, where you have an overdetermined, um, faith in the exchange of property and money it's not it's not that, that you know european societies and aren't aren't um capitalists but they have much stronger countervailing uh rules in terms of development that that and st and stronger rules to protect tenants and and so on much stronger than than here right and also public art processes have more, much more comprehensive engagement with the public and and, and so on but here it's like the power of the private developer just through the tax code is un unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I've seen a couple questions here in the chat from Blaze in Virginia. Would you be so brave as to uh, ask her a question? Just unmuted. Well, I first posted the question to the speakers, uh, other than creating monuments, what are some other models to socially concerned artists? And I have some ideas, but let's hear. I want to hear yours. <laughs> well, I'm I'm actually thinking back a bit to, to history, but it there's a really good summary. I don't know if you guys have read um, the position paper that Clay Lord for Americans for the Arts put together, and he released it on Labor Day about employing artists to work in communities. And he refers back to the WPA that everybody knows about, but he also refers back to CETA in the 1970s. And the two of us were on CETA. And then he also talks about using uh, programs that are in, in existence now, like AmeriCorps, and, and have an artist core of AmeriCorps. And the, the thing with that with communities is that Basically, artists sort of don't go into a community and offer services. A developer is not asking for the artist. A community asks for an artist. So that relationship gets set on the community's terms. Not that it's easy, but it's a different model. And the artist doesn't get paid for the artwork. The artist gets paid a salary. Now, of course, that relies on some sort of funding. Um, but if you haven't seen the American for the Arts paper. Can that go in the chat? Is that, is I, that? I'll go look up the link and I'll, I'll put it. In the I, I did read it because I, I, I particip I'm a member of American for the Arts and, and, and gave a talk last year for the American for the Arts, right? And I mean, I think that's a great model and, and it's a great history, right? Uh, um, but we, it has been, you know, more than half a century since Ronald Reagan. Right. And, and, and things have, you know, even to move half an inch towards that would be, be risk, uh, be, you being accused of being a socialist, uh, you know, and, and so on. And then they'll, then they'll cite all the kind of, you know, 
anti-capitalist murals that came up in the 1930s and you know it's like no end of it but ken but ken this is a moment when obviously oh, no, i agree with you i agree we're, we're going to need to recover from the devastation of, of yeah. the arts right and it's an opening and, yeah. and one way that it's palatable i mean it was signed into law by richard nixon yeah. and a little prior to reagan but it's a it's an employment program it puts artists to work they are they are accountable Right. for their work they are they are accountable to the communities they work no, I, I was gonna, I was it wasn't designed for artists right. it was the job i was just i was just going to add that uh that you know if the present leadership is evicted right then possibly that could come into place because right and and i think the next administration hopefully it's not the same one but the next um, new administration has a glorious opening to really rethink, um, you know, so, uh, society in terms of uh, for the greater good, right? Including how art can play a role, role in that. But, but, but I'm, is, I'm just reciting like the past 60 years has been a territorialization, right? Of, of you know, an ideological territorialization that's being claimed by a very conservative ideology that, that uh, of, you know, no support for people because that engenders weakness and uh and it's a sign of weakness and 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 that poor people other people is necessary because that's the collateral damage we must exist that we must accept in order to have uh product uh, creative productivity drive the nation forward right i mean that's the that's the very pernicious narrative right but ken the point is all right it was 40 years ago not 60. And just to, sh you know, the point is to reclaim possibility, right? Oh, no, I understand that. We're and it's, it is so mind boggling to any young person today that around the, you know, the late 1970s, 10,000 artists were employed around the United States, typically at a salary that if you convert it to current dollars is about $40,000 a year with health benefits and vacation, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that no, issue, young people just don't believe it because it's such a different no, world. It's not that they don't believe it. The, it. the issue is not rationality. The issue is is ideology. Mm. That's the problem. <laughs> and and before I sign off, it doesn't necessarily have to be government funding. I don't know if any of you know Rachel Chanoff, who runs this organization called The Office, but it's an arts advocacy group that actually raises money. And she's involved in a project with museums in the Berkshires where they've raised private money, but not as grants to artists, private money to hire artists to work in communities. So it, it is a, a model. Mm -hmm. Such an awesome dialogue. Thank you so much, Blaze and Virginia and Ken and Karen. I think we have time for one more question. So I wanna, um, Stephanie Fuentes, you wanna ask your question? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yay. Um, wonderful. So I've been on the side as an administrator and I want to ask you as artists, um, you know, for having to create work for public spaces, what do you want from administrators, from city planners to know or to do in order to help you create your best work? Oh, as a disclaimer, be careful, because that's what I was doing until Mayor Kenny shut down the office, and Stephanie too, but. <laughs> well, I mean, I could give the story of uh, when we first did the first iteration of Monument Lab, not the 2017 one, but the 2015 one with Terry Atkins. And um, we went to City Hall, right? We had a, a $600,000 grant from, uh, um, and we were, no, $350,000 grant. And we were to, um, you know, do a kind of small scale one for the, courtyard of City Hall. We went to City Hall. We asked one person in this office and they'd say, we don't know who we should direct you to. I'm not talking about Jacques and that office. I'm talking about, no, I'm talking about engineer, all kinds of other people we were supposed to. And, and there would be people in City Hall that didn't know who to see in another wing of City Hall. And then someone said, said well, you should, and this one name was referred over and over again. And then I said, okay, which office? And, and then one person, you know, I've been here like 20 years. I've never met the guy. <laughs> you know, I said, okay. Yeah, and you're referring to uh, that I go see this person, but you've never met this person, right? So that's, that's one endemic problem <laughs> that city hall. And then the other problem was 
when we tried to set up the Terry Actons in the court in City Hall, a lot of not not shocking them, but a lot of people in City Hall were saying you can't do that, right? Because you can't set up something there, and you can't ask us as you have asked to extend the opening hours of the courtyard because they used to lock the, the these those ugly gates before the new gates at about six o'clock, right? We we can't we have to lock it, and we'd say, well, why? You don't know Philadelphia. You don't know Philadelphians. They would be hanging around. I said, that's the whole point. We want them to hang around the courtyard. It's the most symbolic space in, <laughs> in the city. Thank God someone, I can't remember who it is, some, Paul, Paul Farber will remember, someone said, let's just maybe give it a try. We, 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 maybe this is maybe the right, maybe this is an old mindset we've had about Philadelphia and um, being, you know, just all animals or whatever. And, uh, and so they, they opened it up. Right, so we feel that we opened up space in center, uh, you know, the old uh, court courtyard of C City Hall. We produced that space, in, in in fact, right. So I would say, you know, they should do their business, but they should also be receptive and open to all kinds of possibilities in terms of, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, li living living the reality of the city. My sense was that many of the uh, planners and so on had this conceived notion of the city, but didn't have any lived notion of the city. Karen, um, any final words? Um, listen to artists. <laughs> well, um, to close out, I wanna say first, um, not all city folks are that bad. A lot of them are, but just <laughs> just that's big. But otherwise, I have a lot of um, a lot of thank yous. Honestly, um, thank you, Karen and Ken, for being here. You are both amazing uh, thinkers. Your work is so important, and it really helps to shape, um, make a positive impact in their communities. Um, thank you to our audience for being here and for your support of Art Blog. Art blog is truly a pillar in the community. Let's give it up for Art Blog here. Thank you to my fellow board members who are on this call and just those not also. Board, the board is amazing. Uh, Roberta and Morgan do an amazing job of stewarding us throughout all of this. Um, it's great fun. And lastly, Roberta and Libby, I see you're both on the call here, you know, like you're the co-founders of this, I think of it as an artist project, you know, of this ongoing artist project that I cannot believe is 17 years old now. Um, do you have any last words that you'd like to say? Either of you? You mean Roberta and Libby? Yeah, Roberta and Libby. Can you hear me? I just unmuted myself, but I don't know if I'm being heard. Oh, okay, I've got a thumbs up. Um, well, I would echo, yes, everything is relevant. There's a podcast on Art Blog, we've been talking about it. Go to Art Blog, look for Ken Lum, it'll come up. And then go, there's a link to buy his book. So buy the book, it's great. All right, I guess that's my final words. Go to Art Blog. You'll find it all there. Everything you ever wanted about art is on Art Blog. And thank you to all for coming. Thank you to Libby for being my compatriot for many, many years, setting up Art Blog and running Art Blog and having a wild and crazy and wonderful time. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you.